This is Boom Bust, and these are some of the stories that we're tracking for you today. After days of violent protests in Ferguson, Missouri, tensions are beginning to ease. But the decay that sparked the unrest has been on full display, and it highlights the growing poverty in suburban areas around the country. We're looking into this trend coming right up. Then financial analyst and Veritasium CEO Reggie Middleton is on the show. Reggie sat down with me earlier today to discuss cryptocurrencies. And in today's big deal, Edward Harris and I are talking tech. It all starts now. today, economic inequality and the violence that it creates. International attention has been drawn to the growing poverty in suburban America following days of violent protests in Ferguson, Missouri. The protests erupted after the August 9th police killing of an unarmed black teenager. Since 2000, the poverty rate has doubled in Ferguson, creating a dynamic that has bred hostility over economic inequality and racial segregation. However, Ferguson isn't unique when it comes to these challenges. The nation's 100 largest metropolitan areas have all seen dramatic growth in the poverty of the suburbs that surround them. Not in them, but in the suburbs that surround them. According to a report from the Brookings Institute, the number of suburban neighborhoods where more than 20% of residents live below the federal poverty line has more than doubled since early 2000s. In fact, poor populations are growing twice as fast in U.S. suburbs as in city centers. And the housing crisis spurred an upward trend of suburban poverty, which is more pronounced in the Midwest, while urban gentrification displaced poor people to the suburban fringe, which is far out there. Elizabeth Kneebone, author of the Brookings Report, wrote, quote, We've passed the tipping point, and there are now more poor people in the suburbs than the cities. In those communities, we see things like poorer health outcomes, failing schools, and higher crime rates. In 2000, Ferguson, Missouri was a middle-class suburban enclave with an unemployment rate of 5%. Fast forward just 10 years to 2010, and unemployment had topped 13%, while the number of residents living in poverty has doubled. Now, as affordable housing options in urban areas become fewer and further between, suburbs have absorbed the population looking for cheaper alternatives. Opportunities for low-skilled jobs have become more concentrated in suburbs as well. And in most states in the U.S., including Missouri, local municipalities are allowed to retain their own tax revenue and write their own zoning laws. As a result, wealthier suburbs sometimes write zoning restrictions to ban high-density housing, a.k.a. affordable apartments. However, Ferguson has no such restrictions, and the result is a town with a large and highly concentrated population. According to Elizabeth Kneebone, none of the neighborhoods in Ferguson had a poverty rate above 16% 10 years ago. Today, every neighborhood but one in Ferguson has a poverty rate above 20%, which is the point at which typical social ills associated with poverty, like poor health, high crime rates, and failing schools start to appear. with Bitcoin. We haven't talked about this in a while, at least not in depth. So here's the question. Should more companies look into adopting it as a currency? And does it really offer significant benefits? To get a handle on the world of cryptocurrencies, I was joined earlier by Veritasium CEO Reggie Middleton. I first asked him to tell us about UltraCoin, the cryptocurrency that he created. Here's what he had to say. Well, the elevator pitch is we've created a uh a digital currency that has bettable contracts. So when you use your money to do a transaction or make a deal, all transactions are basically agreements uh, or simple contracts. You can embed the contract or the agreement into the money. So the money is the agreement and the agreement is a contract. Hence, uh, the agreements are unbreakable because they're programmable and embedded into the money. And we can take these unbreakable contracts or unbreakable promises and we can use them to imitate business functions, any business function. Uh, the first product that we have out, uh, value trading, um, imitates the business functions of investment banks and brokerages. So you could trade 
roughly a little over 75,000 tickers in a wide variety of assets, asset classes, stocks, bonds, commodities, silver, across all major exchanges throughout the world, peer-to-peer, -peer, with no exchange risk. Um, you have control of your money um, without a broker, without an exchange. That's one example out of, I'd say, about 15 others that we're working on. Okay, now here's the question. What makes Ultracoin necessary when there's already Bitcoin? Well, what Ultracoin is, it's a marketing moniker. Um, it's a smart contract overlay over Bitcoin. What makes Bitcoin special is the fact that it has its own transmission mechanism, number one, and it could be scripted or programmed. So you could take Bitcoin and you can write a computer program into it to customize it to do X, Y, Z. Ultracoin is that smart, pro smart contract scripting layer on top of Bitcoin. So what Ultracoin is, is a wallet or a client um, application that allows you to create contracts out of Bitcoin. So it's not a separate currency. It is uh, the digital currency Bitcoin or any other digital currency actually, but Bitcoin is the most prevalent. And it's a smart contract overlay. Think of um, Microsoft Office versus C++. C++ is code. Microsoft Office is code developed into an application that allows you to write letters, do spreadsheets, etc. So we are allowing members or people to basically create their own contracts within seconds out of Bitcoin. Okay, now at Boombus, we've stressed that cryptocurrency's promise goes far beyond just payments, and it's also for execution of contracts and transfer of property and identity verification. So, do you think that we'll see companies using cryptocurrency protocols entering those spaces in earnest? Oh, definitely. Um, without revealing any names, uh, I'd say out of the top money center banks, um, I've already been approached by one of the biggest in the world, and I anticipate uh, interaction with, I'd say, three of the top six. <laughs> then if you have to look at the capitalization, you can guess who they may or may not be. Um, the reason is... Congratulations. That's exciting. <laughs> okay, well, you know, deals are not done as of yet, but uh, the reason why there's an interest is if you take a look at um, technology and business models, let's go back to the well, early... 2000, we had MP3. The MP3 technology came out. The technology itself was interesting, but it was perceived as a threat to the music industry. The music industry reacted with litigation, um, with resistance, with lawsuits, and eventually they were able to put Napster out of business, but Pirate Bay and BitTorrent came out, um, Apple came out with iTunes, and essentially they've chopped both the revenues and the profits of the music industry in half, and they're never coming back. The banking industry is now, or uh, the financial services industry is now faced with the same threat. Now, we are at a point of, uh, there's a line of demarcation and uh, inflection point. How do you react? Do you react as the music industry did, or do you attempt to embrace the new technology and move forward with it? Now. I expect 85% of the extant uh, industry to go the music industry route. And I expect the um, more astute actors to go a different route and embrace the technology. And those are the actors that I think are interested in approaching and using this particular technology. We've already developed the API, so you could take our smart contract value trading um, technology and embed it in your own products. And we are also looking at peer-to-peer -peer payments, so you could take what normally MasterCard and Visa used to do, or American Express and PayPal, simple payments, and you could create smart contracts out of them. So you could create a payment, you could walk down, you could do a deal with a total stranger without having to trust them, and that payment will go through exactly as you planned if the total stranger agrees to it. You have a contract, the payment goes through. This is a new form of payments versus a dumb old form, which was dollars, Visa, MasterCard, Swipe, or PayPal transaction with an escrow. So do you see the recent volatility in cryptocurrency values as a problem at all? It's not a problem. It's what happens when you have a new market with a relatively thin float. Um, that's nice. Uh, if you go back to the origin of almost any currency, whether crypto or otherwise, you had the same thing. Um, the precursor to the U.S. dollar, which was a continental note, was very volatile. And I think approximately two to three years after it was issued, it was retired by the government at three, one to three percent of face value, which is about a 97 to 99 percent loss.
That's volatility. That's actually beyond volatility. The U.S. dollar, which is, came after it, was also very volatile in the very beginning. So when things first come out, when they first start, you have volatility. And the volatility comes from speculation, a thin flow, and uncertainty. And as it matures, the volatility tends to die off. Bitcoin has actually matured very, very quickly. And even though there is volatility, you've also had massive capital appreciation. Uh, the dollar has lost roughly 97% of its purchase value since inception. Um, Bitcoin has increased its purchase value by purchasing power by about 2,000 to 3,000%. So if you take a wide look at you know, a more holistic view of it, you know, it's not that bad at all. Reggie, one of the benefits of a cryptocurrency, especially for small businesses, is the low transaction cost that it comes with. And, and, and margin compression is coming into the space as well. So what's driving down the transaction cost even further? Well, there's one thing. You have a very low organic transaction cost. Bitcoins are very, very inexpensive to transact in. And because you have that low cost, the industries that are participating in the Bitcoin transactions, um, since they have a low cost, they can, they have the option to um, drop prices significantly. There's a lot of price uh, elasticity for them. But as competition comes in, um, and the barriers to entry are relatively low in the Bitcoin space, the only way they can differentiate themselves thus far is to drop the price or differentiate in the business model. And since the business models are relatively rudimentary because this is a brand new space, they compete by dropping prices. Uh, you have BitPay and Coinbase, you have Circle, you have other companies, and they are competing soon with PayPal and MasterCard, Visa, American Express. And when you have all this money and all this capital flying into a space where the Inherent costs are very low, they're gonna, there's going to be price competition. I anticipate um, right now we have margins approaching zero. Both BitPay and Coinbase have uh, products that are for free, and soon margins are going to go negative. In other words, they're going to give away processing as a loss leader for um, other services. That was Reggie Middleton, CEO of Veritasium and inventor of Ultracoin. Time now for a quick break, but stick around because when we return, cybersecurity expert Dan Gear will be on the show. Dan sat down with me at the Black Hat Conference in Las Vegas to talk about potential security threats facing our global financial markets. It's pretty heavy and interesting stuff. And in today's big deal, Edward Harrison and I are talking about Apple, Uber, Sprint, and every other fun tech topic that we can think of. Plus, remember, you can see all segments featured in today's show on YouTube at youtube.com slash boombustrt and on Hulu at hulu.com slash boom dash bust. Now, before we go, here are a look at some of your closing numbers of the bell. Come on back with us. The government says it wants to close Gitmo. The Secretary of Defense and Defense Department are committed to the president's goal of closing Guantanamo Bay. But why are there so many legal roadblocks for the remaining detainees? The United States Constitution doesn't apply to these proceedings. The government has demonstrated that they have no respect for the attorney-client relationship. No, you can't look inside that door. No, you can't see the place which is adjacent to the client cell. If the public knew what actually happened, that heads would roll. There are a lot of issues that are being handled at a higher level. Join us as we seek answers to those issues and much more. This is Abby Martin breaking the set from Guantanamo Bay. I'm the resident, and I know words are powerful. Words like sheep, as in people who buy the crap our media sells us are acting like a bunch of sheep. Or words like greedy, as in our entire financial system is rigged by a bunch of greedy jerks. Or words like consumers, as in there's more to life than just being gluttonous consumers. I'm the resident, and I'm fighting idiocy one carefully chosen word at a time. Now, while most of us are concerned about our personal items being hacked, 
One issue that continues to intrigue me is the security of our financial markets, especially since both the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange have gone dark in the past 18 months. Dark. To learn more about these potential threats facing the markets, I spoke with computer com security expert Dan Gere at the Black Hat Cybersecurity Convention. I first asked him how Wall Street has developed in terms of cybersecurity over the years. Here's what he had to say. I think that in particular, the New York-based banks then and now similar institutions, not just there, but the city in London and so forth, have, have long been the avatars in cybersecurity. And I think part of that is a unique characteristic of banks, and that is the bigger you are, the more of the business you do with other banks like yourselves. Your, com your customers and suppliers are, are also your competitors. And in a way, the fact that you are in such a situation has long caused a kind of technologic warfare, if you want to think of it that way, or maybe it's technologic judo. Um, if I can convince you to buy this, then I've got you. Um, a technologic judo that has contributed to being willing to consider risk modes that most people don't. And of course they have the cash flow to support investment that ordinary institutions don't. But what about from a vulnerability perspective? You know, these things went dark and no one seems to really care. So is this a big deal to you? Does this concern you? It's concerning to me in the sense that it's oh, the last five years in finance have proved that we are, I say finance has proved a general point, which is true elsewhere. But it's true in finance that we can build things more complicated than we can then anticipate how they work. Uh, running them is harder than building them. And I don't know if that's a threshold per se. I believe it is. There was a time when we could always run something we could build. But now, I think we can build things, and, and speed is most of this. Most of it's speed. I mean, the flash crash thing and all that, most of it's speed. But we can build things that are too hard to operate, or, or, or maybe the point is non-deterministic to operate. We can't say what will happen. And I don't know if that's why they crash. I honestly don't. If you want to go back 20 years, I can tell you a squirrel took down NASDAQ <laughs> by gnawing through just the right cable and electrocuting itself. But you know, after that, you'd, no more squirrels did that. But a squirrel has done that. Um, I don't think you could do that today. I don't think there's any squirrels capable of taking down the NASDAQ or whatever. But uh, what we can take it down with is who knew that the, that the interaction space had this path through it that we can't simulate because it's too complex. I mean, that's what Jeff was talking about in the, at this morning. I, I honestly don't know what his term radical simplicity means, but I, I can guess it means no extraneous dependencies. And an exchange will work at that, but there's an awful lot of dependencies in an exchange setting not the least of which is fairness to everybody. This guy's got a nanosecond jump on everybody else. What do I do? Do I penalize him a nanosecond? You know, what do, what do I do? Is there a true threat to the global financial markets being hacked, uh, especially given that it is all computerized now? There is this bit about SIFMA asking for a war council. On the, and I don't have that document. I mean, to some extent, a good homework assignment for you folks here is to get your hands on it and see exactly what they have to say about why they, they want a war council where you have in effect CIOs or CISOs or for all I know CFOs of all the big uh, financial institutions wanting to sit down on a regular basis with uh, what do they say eight deputy assistant secretaries so you know t f um, um, FTC and DHS and Treasury and um, and DOD, you know, wh why do you ask for a war council? And the answer is because you think that the opponents you now face are ones for which your capacity to prevent them from doing what they want to do is not and cannot be sufficient. And you need to call in the cavalry or the reinforcements or whatever. And the obvious reinforcements, if you're a Manhattan-based bank, are in Washington. Now, I don't know what that document said, but its existence says something, and the existence says that if it is indeed nation states or proxies for nation states, you know, who attacked Estonia? A proxy. 
but they were a smiled upon proxy. You know, I almost think the attack on Estonia was a job interview. Let's show you what we can do. And we show you what you can do, and then you say, fine, you, from now on you have protection. And so um, if you are a financial institution looking at state level actors or those who have the kind of capacity that ordinarily is thought of as requiring a national laboratory. And there are only, what, 10 countries that you can talk about there. I'm not making fun of Africa, but there aren't any. Um, okay. There are only some in Asia, but they're important. So, and I could go on, but the, the idea that you would call for something that amounts to a war council and call it that, and say that we can't, we can no longer defend ourselves, and you, I assume you have noticed that we're essential. That's as good a, what was it Thoreau said about some uh, circumstantial evidence is uh, uh, convincing like finding a trout in the milk? Um, <laughs> this is circumstantial, okay. but I think it answers your question. Yeah. The mere existence of that document, and I would hope to, that you can find it. No, I don't think the right to be forgotten is the last word. But the question of, if I can't prevent people observing me, don't I get some control over what can be looked up about me, strikes me as appropriate. Um, no, I don't like the idea that everybody has to report everything bad that happens. But above some level, it needs to, it needs to go on. Sure, you can't hide a plane crash, by and large. But you can hide, and you know we do, cyber attacks that I think the act of hiding them all but guarantees that they will be effective again. So we need a threshold above which, and maybe banks lead the way. They could well. Uh, you need a threshold above which you say, no, you're going to report that. So let's argue about the threshold. Let's argue what that should be. Is it measured in dollars? Is it measured in lives? Is it measured in I don't know what? Is it measured in minutes of downtime? You know, um, um, you might say the proposal to, if, if a piece of software that is in wide use is abandoned by its maker, the maker has to also abandon the privilege of keeping you from seeing the source. You're not going to support it. Therefore, you have said it is of no value to you. You must show everybody how it works so that those who must use it or want to use it can protect themselves even if you won't. Kind of like nautical law. You abandon it, someone else wants it, they can have it. Anyway, that was cybersecurity expert Dan Gear. Time now for today's Big Deal. Big Deal time with Edward Harrison, and today we're talking tech. Web day. Web yes. day. Um, we're specifically discussing Apple, Uber, Nextdoor, Spider Oak, and Sprint. Let's start off with Apple. They are doing bonkers well. So tell me what's going on there, Ed. How are, what's happening there? Well, yeah, you, uh, I think we, uh, we spoke to Reggie a little bit about that. I'm not sure if that part uh, of the clip played. But uh, basically, they're at a new all-time high. Mm -hmm. People are piling in. They think it's a great company. My view on Apple is that uh, it's actually a much slower growth company than the last time it hit 700. Basically, it started returning money to uh, investors, and the only reason uh, earnings per share are going up as much as they are is because basically they have uh, been buying back shares, and, and that's the only way that they're going to really uh, get money back to the shareholders. I'm not really bullish on Apple in that sense. I think that Apple's a great company, but I don't really know if uh, at these levels I'd be piling into Apple shares. Okay, at these levels, you're saying? Right. You're not saying that it's garbage? It's just no, not now. at all. Got it. It's a great company. Now, it wouldn't be a normal day if we didn't have Uber in the headlines. Oh, uh, so yes. <laughs> they are, talk about a company that's growing, even though you're still Uberish. Um, so what's the big news there? Talk to me about this. Yeah, well, you tell me, because uh, there are a lot of different things about it. Uh, a lot of different things. The, what actually, you know, you were talking about the API Uber has hooked up with um, 
have Travelocity, I believe it is. Uh, can you name some of the other uh, ones? It was, uh, what's the, a trip, advisor, trip Advisor, United Airlines, et cetera. United Airlines. The, the deal with that it basically is, and it's not that sexy, the, the APIs, how uh, companies integrate for their software, is, is that really they're getting all these other travel companies who are doing other kinds of travel stuff mm -hmm. to give them leads. So if you're in United Airlines and you want to have like an Uber waiting for you, boom, United will take all of their stuff and feed it into the Uber system automatically and their Uber will be. So it will be a seamless process. And you know what, I, actually I think that's amazing. So you don't have to leave the United Airlines website to book your car. I, I would use that. And I know this is an anecdotal <laughs> thumbs up, but it, I mean, that, it just seems like a huge Definitely. get for Uber against Lyft in terms of, you know, really taking hold of a marketplace that, that you want a presence in, travel and, all around. And the thing that you liked, I think, that we were talking about is uh, the delivery service. Love the delivery service. I, I was in New York and I, I had a, a package delivered to me for it was something like five ninety five is what it came to. And it was straight across Midtown, uh, east to west in the middle of the day, which if you're ever in New York, you know it's an impossible journey to make at, at 1 p.m. So uh, so I'm impressed by it, and I would use it again. And I think that you combine those two, and you can see that Uber is basically trying to break out of its space. It's not just that the API is, go API is going to be about the cab rides, uh, but it's also going to be about other stuff. Right. They're going right. to be a much bigger travel company. Than just taxis. Now, I want to move on. Uh, next door. that's a social app uh -huh. created to make neighbors talk to each other, which is actually hysterical <laughs> if you think about right. it. Let's use our app to like yell across the, the hedges. It's but the, tell me the about this. The anti Facebook. The yeah. anti which I mean, I, I'm a fan, a fan. Yeah, I don't know uh, what it says. I thought it was kind of interesting that so many different communities are using this. This is a way because, you know, a, a huge number of people in the United States don't know their neighbors. It's a way of connecting people together in a way that is uh, safe and secure, but also in a way that isn't like Facebook. It's about, it's really, you know, about the community that you live in and you could almost call it like a super uh, um, board, like you know, like you right. have it at, at a college or university, where everyone in your neighborhood posts to that board and they can interact with one another. Like the student union for the board. Now we only have 30 seconds, but I want to ask you about Spider Oak. Um, they just announced their installment of a uh, Warrant Canary. So what is this? Yeah. So basically, Spider Oak is the drop box for the tenfold hat crowd. Nice. It's, uh, zero knowledge is what they talk about. They don't know anything about all the stuff that you do. It's all encrypted at you. Your premises. They have now said that whenever the uh, government comes with a warrant, they are going to have a special notice that says, uh, all, they will always have a notice that says, we have not given the, uh, away any information. As soon as That's they take right. that notice down, then you know that, that the government that is looking for Good. documents. I mean, that's fantastic stuff. In situations like Kim.com, it's better from a business perspective for uh, Spider Oak. Not going to have to close down their sites. That's all for now, but we love hearing from you. Thank you, Ed, by the way. Please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash boombustrt. And please tweet at us at Aaron Aid, at Edward NH. From all of us here at Boombust, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.